Some of you probably know that tomorrow is the uh, 40th anniversary of uh, the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. And I'd like to dedicate this presentation to him. Um, I met Dr. King when I was five years old. And uh, I don't remember a lot about the meeting um, except shaking his hand and the total attention that he gave to this unknown five-year-old shaking my hand. So I just, I remember the presence. And I, I, I hope that a little bit of his commitment to the truth has rubbed off on me. And this talk is a little, something I've never done before in public. I'm going to try to share with you um, sort of a range of my experiences and my understanding of these experiences as best I'm able to convey that. But I, I think it's really important to say that I'm going to be framing these experiences a particular way, but the way that I'm framing them is only one of many, many ways they could be framed. And the potency of the actual experiences is lost in any framing of them. So the frame isn't the thing, but I'm going to have to frame it somehow. So <laughs> <laughs> I have been uh, giving public education talks about whales for five years. And I just I love talking about whales. I love all the cool things that whales do. I love talking about the folk process in, in humpback whale song. I love talking about how fin and blue whales can communicate across thousands of miles of ocean. I love talking about how the migratory whales uh, spend their winters in the tropics fasting all winter and then spend their summers in the uh, plankton rich waters of the higher latitudes feasting all summer long. And when I do give whale talks, I always talk a bit about the threats that the whales are facing, uh, being uh, hit by ships, getting entangled in fishing gear, and these two uh, things account for 50% of the known uh, right whale mortality. I talk about pollution. I talk about ocean acidification, which is one of the lesser known and really lesser understood uh, possible consequences of global warming as the oceans ab absorb CO2 and affecting the uh, ability of uh, coral and shellfish to uh, produce their calcium. Uh, this could have huge, huge devastating impacts on the ocean, but we don't really know for sure. I talk about how uh, the, o the whale's world is really a, a sonic world their uh, communication, probably their social cohesion, uh, possibly some aspects of finding food, all have to do with the sonic environment. So any, any sound pollution and the increase uh, in ship traffic and Navy sonar and all these things, although again, we don't really know exactly how it's affecting them, it must be affecting them in some way because they're so deeply dependent on sound. And then I usually talk a little bit about the whaling that's still going on, Japan, Norway, and Iceland. But that, all of that, is not what this talk is about. <laughs> because for most of my adult life, I have really been interested in what are the root causes of these problems. I am interested in whether total transformation is possible. Not just another us versus them, you know, we get our way, you don't get your way kind of trans transformation, but one in which all of us together suddenly go off in a totally different, unexpected direction. So in order to bring you along to where I am with this, and this does have something to do with whales, believe it or not, I'm going to share a little personal history, and I don't know how to do this other than kind of getting personal, because that's where this all has come from for me. Uh, and I'm going to be sharing with you two 
experiences in my life that have been absolutely formative. They've changed how I view myself, they've changed how I view the world, and they've changed how I live. So this all started for me 25 years ago uh, when I was a senior getting my uh, bachelor's degree in linguistics. And my senior year I took a course in animal communication. And the two things that intrigued me most in that course were the songs of humpback whales and songbirds. And so I wrote a paper on the uh, development of uh, vocal development, a comparative comparison of vocal development in songbirds and children. And I spent hours listening to whale songs and for the first time discovered Roger Payne, who later became a good friend and mentor in my whale work. Uh, Roger discovered that humpback whales sing. Uh, he discovered theoretically that fin whales and blue whales are able to communicate across thousands of miles. And he pioneered the use of callosity patterns on right whales to be able to identify individuals, much the way humpback whales are identified by their uh, individual fluke patterns. And uh, when I graduated, um, I thought it would be pretty cool to do work with somebody who was doing dolphin communication work. I had a degree in linguistics. I sort of thought maybe that would fly. I sent out letters and made phone calls and got absolutely nowhere, maybe because I had never had a biology class in my life. <laughs> Um, so for reasons I don't really understand and understood even less than, I ended up in a Catholic worker community in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, living and working with homeless people. And we had uh, 13 people who stayed with us uh, semi-permanently and we fed uh, people on the street three times a day and sheltered hundreds of people every night. And um, the other thing that we were doing was uh, working in opposition to George's death penalty with street actions and with visitation to the men who were on death row. And I never visited death row, but I had a written correspondence uh, with one man, uh, Alpha Stevens, who was executed while I was there. And uh, I attended the execution and uh, I dug his grave. Um, Alpha was an amazing man, a black man. He stated right up until the very end that he was innocent. And he had a heart the size of the world. And right up to the end, he said he bore no malice whatsoever toward the people who were killing him. I left Atlanta after a year and came back to Vermont because I kind of wanted to get a bead on what poverty looked like in Vermont. And something about this, the open door, um, there was this place in Rutland, another shelter for homeless uh, men called the open door, as was the place in Atlanta. And um, so I spent some time in Rutland doing the same thing, living and working in a homeless shelter. And I fell into a, a deep despair because I felt like I was doing good work and I felt like there was something going on that my work wasn't even touching. So I wanted, uh, Dom Helder Camara, the Brazilian priest said, why is it that when I feed the poor they call me a saint and when I ask why the poor have no food they call me a communist? I wanted to know why there were so many homeless and so much violence, but not just the political in the economic wise. I wanted to know the deepest possible why. Why do we do this? Social and economic inequity have been part of our experience for millennia. Is this the final word on human civilization? I was in deep deep darkness and looking for any crack of light. So what did I do? I went to a war zone. I met a woman who had just come back from Nicaragua and she was on fire. She said she'd seen something in Nicaragua that she had never seen before in her life. An incredible vitality and joyfulness in the midst of a terrible, terrible, devastating war. I wanted to see that. 
So off I went, looking for a miracle. I went to Nicaragua in the midst of the proxy war that the United States was waging against the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere with claims that if we didn't wipe them out, the Sandinistas would be on the Texas border in a matter of months. Terrible, terrible threat to our national security. But the really astonishing thing is that I got an answer to my question. And it was not what I was expecting. I didn't really know that I was doing this at the time. This is all kind of retrojected understanding. But I carried to Nicaragua the entire package of my conditioning. All the worldview that I'd inherited from my family and culture growing up in Vermont. I had an idea about who I was and how the world worked. And in its own context, that framework worked pretty well. In Nicaragua, it was <laughs> shredded, totally. The whole thing. For 10 days, my mind was in turmoil, trying to fit what it was seeing and experiencing into this framework that it had about how the world worked. It tried denial. It tried making up stories. It tried arguing. It tried complaining. It tried reframing. You name it, it tried any strategy it could think of to fit what was happening, what I was actually seeing and hearing and experiencing into what I already knew. Total failure. So one afternoon, um, thousands of Nicaraguans had been marching across the country. And we received, in, in, in protests against the war and in celebration of the coming Easter, and we received news that there had been an attack 30 miles from where th the group that I was with uh, were working on a Habitat for Humanity project. And uh, the uh, press release that we sent home read like this. Six people were killed Sunday, February 16th, riding home from a march for peace and life in the depths of Chinandega, Nicaragua. The six and nine others who were injured were ambushed and shot after their truck hit a landmine. They were returning to their homes after the walk. More than 200 bullet holes were counted in the truck. A 29-year-old Swiss man was among the dead. The rest were all women and children. One woman who was injured told reporters that she was trying to breastfeed her baby after the truck had been stopped by the mine when she heard rifle shots and the screams of other women. According to newspaper accounts, the attack was carried out by the Contras with CIA help. The headlines of one paper read, Reagan responsible. This is the most recent of the attacks by the Contras on the civilian population. We had agreed as a group not to travel into directly into areas of conflict. But something in me snapped. And I told the group that I simply had to see this. I had to touch it. I had to make it real. I couldn't come back to Vermont with somebody else's story. So after much uh, argument, we agreed as a group to find the survivors of the attack. And in a hospital in Leon, Nicaragua, the lid was blown off my world. To shorten a very long story, where I expected to find grief and destruction and mourning, I did find all of that. But I also found an incomprehensible joy in a room with a 10-year-old girl whose body had been blown to pieces by bullets and shrapnel, I and a room full of doctors and nurses and visitors and other patients were smiling and laughing and dancing 
for the sheer uncontainable joy of the meeting. How is that even possible? This gets really hard to talk about. In fact, I think it's fair to say that my whole life has been oriented to understanding the core of this experience. Something happened that day that's completely beyond description. The best I can say right now is that for the first time in my life, I allowed my devotion to illusion to fall away. And I allowed the real to live and breathe. My mind finally dropped its attempt to filter, deny, understand, conceptualize, fit the new into some template of the familiar, and it entered into total engagement. I entered into total engagement with the truth. Mind, eyes, and heart wide open, taking it all in, willing to go wherever life was leading. And because I'm not the only person this happened to in Nicaragua, it has to be said that the Nicaraguans at that time in their history, coming out of decades of oppressive dictatorship were also experiencing a new measure of freedom. And despite the war being waged against them, were wide open themselves. And astonishingly willing to forgive, to release us from our bonds of guilt. Incredibly freeing. So there was a meeting in openness without the overlay of the conceptual framework that I'd carried with me. And when you take away the conceptual framework, I mean really let it fall away. The underlying reality is love. I mean, what is love but total openness? Not as a concept, but as actual physical lived reality, openness to everyone, welcoming of everyone and everything exactly as it is. So my way of framing reality and understanding it fell to pieces and I fell into love. And it was a profound homecoming. I felt like I had come home to a place I never knew that I had left. So I came back to Vermont after this experience, on fire myself, this you know, was 22 years ago, and everything was upside down. What once was familiar now felt strange. The ordinary lives being lived here just seemed crazy. I recall being plagued by the question, how do we live? How do we stay fully alive in a culture that loves death and deals death and profits from death and teaches death? Not just deadly to people and plants and animals, deadly to the spirit, soul killing. I lived in the woods for a couple of years. I didn't know where else to go. I lost my job. I entered a monastery in search of a radical change of life. I knew the prior foundation of my life had been shaken. And I had no words, no words to describe it at that time. And that's OK, because I was really looking for a way to live it, not just a way to talk about it. So nine years later, things had calmed down a bit. I was beginning to normalize to my social environment a little bit again. And a lot of this had kind of gone back into the background. And my girlfriend and I were on vacation in Nova Scotia. And I was feeling a bit confused about my life because I'd had this incredible experience nine years ago. And I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know how to talk about it. So on a foggy, rainy day, 
uh, in August, my girlfriend decided we should go on a whale watch, which I thought was just the stupidest idea I'd ever heard of. <laughs> the very idea of going out on a boat and being a gawky tourist and, you know, scaring the whales off their food, just, you know, uh, I thought it was stupid. She really wanted to go, so we went. And on this cold and rainy, foggy day, we motored around and we motored around. We didn't see anything except fog and rain and a little bit of water. It was close to the boat. And um, most of the passengers were in the cabin of the boat. And I was standing on the aft deck on the port side, at, standing at the rail, just staring out into the rain and wondering, what on earth am I doing here? I think there might have been some other passengers back there, but I don't remember them. All I remember is the water and the rain and the fog. And this thing suddenly appeared right next to the boat, just beyond the reach of my fingers. One of these, fin whale. And it, it exhaled in my face, baptizing me in whale breath. It's like that. And uh, I entered a different time space. I mean, this whale was twice as long as the boat I was on, but still, I mean, it just took forever for this whale to go by. Like, it was like waiting for a train at the crossing, you know. It, it probably only took 15 seconds, but it felt like forever. In the back of the whale, a small dorsal fin, two-thirds of the way along the back. And then it was gone. And normal time returned, and I started screaming. Oh my god! Oh my god! Everybody comes running out of the cabin, and I'm jumping up and down on the deck of the boat. Oh my god! It was Nicaragua all over again. I was just thrust into total joy. Now, this happens to a lot of people with whales. So there's something going on that I don't really understand. And I have a sense of part of what's going on, but I just want to read you one little quote from uh, John F., uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who's the senior attorney at the NRDC. And he's speaking about meeting a gray whale for the first time. <laughs> I'm not a very sentimental person, and I don't think we ought to save animals because they're cuddly and pettable. But it's simply an amazing experience having those whales roll over and look you in the eye. There really is an interspecies contact there. There's an intelligence, and it's undeniable. It's different from any experience I've ever had, and I've been around animals all my life. It's like two universes touching and finding commonality. That's about as far as I'm willing to go with that. But, well, it's truly an extraordinary experience. I've been with hundreds of people now who are seeing a whale for the first time. And my reaction of total abandon into joy is not uncommon. It's not universally true, but it's not uncommon. And my sense of this, which may not surprise you too much after my experience in Nicaragua, 
Whales are so big and so graceful and so silent and so mysterious, living most of their lives out of sight and out of reach, and so unprecedented on first meeting. I think what happens is the chatter of the mind comes to a full stop. All the mental activity that takes the present and tries to relate it to the past, to what is already known and familiar, just stops. The mind meets something it can't pigeonhole, and the whole person comes into direct engagement with the sheer fact of whale. This is a profound event, but I think most people miss the true significance of it. They fail to notice how committed they normally are to all that mental activity. And they fail to notice what was present when it was absent. They think the excitement comes from what happened, which it did in part. But my experience tells me that the real excitement comes from what didn't happen. The mind did not interpret. The mind did not try to understand. The mind didn't try to fit the present to the past. It didn't try to escape into an imagined future. It stopped labeling, and reality had a chance to emerge into the foreground. Reality in which you and the whale meet in perfect stillness, one movement of life together. And joy erupts, and you fall in love and for that one moment, you are returned to who you are fundamentally. Last year, I had a British couple with me on one of my trips, and we saw a ton of humpback whales, and it was beautiful. And the whole trip back, all they could say was, I had no idea. I had no idea. Over and over, I'd go back and visit them every few minutes. I had no idea. <laughs> Which is exactly right. They had no preconceived notion with which to diminish the raw, unmediated experience. And they were clearly awestruck and deeply in love and changed. So the lesson for me of Nicaragua and of meeting whales is that we live our lives in devotion to a mental framework, most of it deeply unconscious, that defines and describes and determines our response to reality. This is our oversimplified internal model of the world. It helps us move around. And then we start to think that that model defines us, that it tells us what the world really is and who we really are. So then when the model comes into conflict with reality, we prefer the model. We fight to the death to preserve the model, our self-image, our image of the world our oh-so-familiar beliefs and opinions and habitual ways of reacting, because we think that is who we are. Through this, we create conflict in ourselves, in our world, and we create deep division out of that which is essentially whole. This is going on all the time within us and around us. We see it in all of the conflict in the world. Most attempts at change involve trying to change the model, change the paradigm, change the belief system, or you know, try to get other people to convert to my belief system. I'm trying to point to a shift 
that is of a different order. It's about dropping the model, dropping the belief system entirely, at least as a source of identity. When the mind finally decides to abandon its framework, as I did for the first time in Nicaragua, when it really sees its own activity at work and realizes this isn't really working, and it must drop it, the floodgates open. All reality, indescribable, the good, the painful, the ugly, all our tendency to want to control and manipulate and have things our way, all the extraordinary beauty of being cosmos, earth, water, planet, animal consciousness, <laughs> all the deep mystery behind it, all that, all of that is welcomed without any attempt to sort it out, without any attempt to sort it into the parts I like, the parts I don't like, the parts I understand, the parts I don't understand, the parts I can control, the parts I can't control, all of that. This is no small thing in my experience. It's really the unraveling of that which most of us live in utter devotion to. It's what we think we are, our thoughts and opinions and reactions. Not that any of that disappears completely, it just no longer forms the foundation of who I think I am. There's a deeper foundation that appears on which all of that stands. What appears is what's been here all along, unnoticed, the deep, dark soil in which we are rooted. And there's a loss. It's a small loss, but it feels like a big loss. It's a loss of a clear sense of existing as a separate self. For that sense of a separate self as an independent being came from adhering to some form of exclusivity. That sense of self was achieved and maintained by being in opposition or resistance or competition with someone or something, with some aspect of life as it is. It defined itself as no, not that, anything but that. It can't survive yes, 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 yes to everything and everyone. And that's because there is only one thing that can truly, authentically, deeply say yes to absolutely everything as it is. And that is the movement of everything exactly as it is. That movement includes us, but it doesn't come from us. There's a strong and beautiful thread in environmental conservation of loving life, all of life, really loving it, wanting life, including the human, to be wild and free and vibrant and full and surprising and uncomfortable and shocking to civilized sensibilities. And there's a countervailing tendency to want to tame the world to domesticate it, to manage it and make it fit our desires for it, to try to put it all, ourselves, especially ourselves included, in a very predictable box of our making. That tendency bears watching. Also, I'd suggest that we need to keep our eyes open for the possibility that those 
who at this time really prefer control to the freedom of love, may be realizing that the environmental crisis is fertile ground for manipulation, manipulative and controlling technologies and policies. People are getting scared about the future. And we know, especially since 9-11, that when people are afraid, they're willing to accept being controlled and manipulated. For me, there's no question that the forces that threaten the whales and all life by keeping us in thrall to our current lifestyle and to our current way of seeing the world and ourselves are not merely personal but social and political. In truth, there's no separation between the social, the political, and the personal. Each creates the other. We are all caught up in a millennia-old collective agreement to live off the exploitation of the Earth and each other. Historian John Croson refers to this as the exploitative normalcy of civilization. The shift I'm describing is the unraveling of this exploitative normalcy that is choking the planet. When people stop buying the story of insufficiency and discover their true abundance in everything, the whole edifice collapses. The desire for control, in my experience, springs from a deep, deep feeling of insecurity and separation. When you really see your true self in everything, what can you possibly be lacking? But some of us profit directly from the exploitation system. Those of us who think our self-interest is best served by maintaining the exploitative normalcy of human civilization are unlikely to let go of it easily, unlikely even to see the destructive part that we play. We'll need a little help. And we will need to be open to having our entire world and self-images turned inside out and upside down. And we will need a new place to stand, some place of a different order. For me, that place is deep silence, the still center of us all. I would encourage you, if you haven't done so, to become acquainted with silence. There is abundance in silence beyond imagining. In conclusion, I'd like to read something that I wrote for a workshop, day-long workshop on whales that I led last October and it's called Me or Not Me. I've spent most of my life asking the big questions. What am I? Why are we so violent? Can we live in harmony with each other and all the creatures and all the earth? For all that asking, I feel I have little to offer. But there is one thing that I do know beyond any doubt. Everything is as it is. One act of being. We live in devotion not to the dynamic nature of what is, but to a fragmentary image, to a story concocted in the mind to make sense out of what it cannot truly comprehend. The mind lives by distinction and differentiation, by relating what is new to what it already knows. That is its nature. So if we live in exclusive devotion to the mind's image of reality, we live in fragments. 
We live in the belief in distinction and separation. The only reality is the whole of everything. This is not trivial. These habits of the mind go very deep. They are ingrained in the nervous system. Some aspects of the mind's story are obviously negative and destructive, though we still devote ourselves to them. Hate, prejudice, envy. Others are accepted by nearly everyone as normal. For instance, the thought habit that identifies the body as me, that puts a label on anything that happens on or within the body as me, and anything outside the membrane of skin as not me. What about the oxygen the body breathes in and the carbon dioxide it breathes out? Me or not me? What about the water it drinks or the ocean, the source of that water? Me or not me? What about the plant or the animal that produces the proteins and the minerals that make blood and bone? Me or not me? Or the sun that fuels it all? Or the elementary particles spread through the universe that make up that sun and make up me? What about the vast expanses of empty space between stars or the silence between thoughts. Me or not me? Where does the body begin and where does it end? Where do I begin and where do I end? Who am I in reality as opposed to the whole shopping cart load of who or what I think I am or think I should be? If I come to this point realizing that what I've always accepted as me is just a deeply habitual thought pattern, a limited framing of reality, if I really come to this point, what happens? Find out. Find out what it means to live in devotion to the truth rather than the illusion of separation. To live in devotion to the incomprehensible. I can't tell you what will happen, but this feels to me like the root of the whole problem. It's why we see ourselves as separate from nature, from each other. It's why we are unwilling to question our most treasured cultural and personal assumptions. It's why we fall into devotion to greed and comfort and security, to getting more and more for ourselves. It's why we are so uncomfortable, so uncomfortable, with the idea of having or being or becoming less. It's why our opinions and beliefs are so inflexible, so resistant to being contradicted even by our own experience. It's why we create enemies. It's why we close our eyes to injustice. Because we believe in the mental image of ourselves. We believe that our thoughts and our opinions define us that they tell us who we really are. We live out the whole drama of believing the story of the self, whatever that story may be, and we forget the wholeness. We forget what we truly are, the whole of everything. Our task is simple, to welcome life, all of life, all of it, especially the parts we don't like, in its awesome, uncomfortable fullness. Let it grab us and shake us 
and remind us of who and what we truly are. If we will only allow it, life will return us home to love. It has to, because love is what we truly are, and love is where we truly live.